Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Maas from UC Berkeley, and I would like to talk a little bit about the state of Java on RISC-V, and uh, more generally, uh, managed languages in general. So managed languages account for a large portion of workloads across a wide range of platforms. Uh, many popular server workloads are written in languages like Java, PHP, or C Sharp. Within the browser, all your code is written in JavaScript, or more recently, WebAssembly. And on mobile, you have languages like Java, but also Swift and Objective-C. So one goal of RISC-V should be to target as many languages of these as possible and targeting them well. So I would like to focus on Java for the purpose of this talk, because Java is kind of one of the most widely used languages in this space. And if you remember my talk from about a year ago at the fifth RISC-V workshop, uh, we currently have two ports of JVMs for RISC-V in progress. One of them is uh, OpenJDK, which is perhaps the most widely used JVM. And the other is the JIX Research VM, which is very popular in ma uh, managed language research because it's easy to modify. So I will touch on Hotspot a little bit later, but for now I would like to focus on the JIX RVM. Specifically, I want to show you the work that we've done since the last year to um, bring basically our port to completion uh, to the point where it can now actually run on real RISC-V hardware and run full Java applications. I'd then like to show you how this kind of uh, JVM port can be used for academic computer architecture research to do experiments that were difficult to do with previous infrastructure. And finally, I'd like to take a step back and talk more about the state of Java and RISC-V in general and tell you how you can get involved. So last year, our JIXR VM port for RISC-V was able to run uh, small applications but still had some missing features and some corner cases that weren't quite working. We fixed this up over the last year, and now it's actually running full uh, Java 6 application, including uh, the parts of the Dacapo benchmark suite that are supported by JIX, which includes large applications like the Lucene search engine or Ray Tracer. Um, it also now passes the full uh, core test suite of JIX RVM, which means that it's uh, almost ready for upstreaming after a little bit more cleanup. And uh, this port uh, so far only includes the non-optimizing baseline compiler, so the optimizing compiler is still work in progress. But uh, so basically, this at this point is like 15,000 lines of code and uh, 86 files. So we're hoping to upstream this soon and then hopefully move on to the optimizing compiler in the future. So while we were doing this port, we learned a lot of lessons that might be useful for implementers of future managed runtime sports for RISC V. So we wrote all of them up in a, a CAF workshop paper, which was presented about a month ago. So if you are interested in this, you can find it on the website. And it has a lot of the kind of details how we did this port. And so with this port in place, what we can now do is we can boot up a rocket ship instance on an FPGA, run Linux, and then actually run Java applications on top of Linux. So here, we just basically run JIX. We um, run it with a verbose output to make it a bit more interesting. And then you can see how the JVM is starting up. It's initializing all the classes. It's initializing all the JVM infrastructure and then running an application. So this is just a toy example. But as I mentioned before, this actually runs large workloads now as well. So here we took the... Um, subset of the Dacapo benchmarks that we were running, and we executed those on an FPGA and rocket ship. And as you can see, these are actually quite long-running workloads. So together, these are over a trillion instructions, um, which means that you can now use this to actually evaluate long-running Java workloads in a way that would have been difficult on a software simulator um, for which a trillion instructions are a lot of cycles to simulate. And it is actually this property that we can now execute long-running Java workloads on FPGAs that helps us use this in academic computer architecture research. Now, I'd now like to give you a couple of examples how this might actually help us do experiments or manage languages uh, that would have been difficult in, uh, with previous infrastructure. Now, managed languages have been underrepresented in academic computer architecture research for a while. So this was a paper from almost 10 years ago that pointed out that we should really be looking more into managed languages. And uh, not too much has changed uh, until then. There's still very little work that actually uh, looks at the intersection of kind of these high-level language runtimes and the architecture underpinning this. And this leaves a lot of potential optimization and interesting work on the table. And I agree there are a couple of reasons why there isn't more of this work. And this has to do with the structure of managed language workloads in general. So managed language workloads tend to be very long-running and run across a large number of cores. They also tend to be very irregular because they have all these extra tasks running in parallel, like, for example, the garbage collector and the JIT compiler. And finally, they have very fine-grained interactions which are very difficult to capture in high-level models, like, for example, with your garbage collector communicating with the application. So what this means is that these workloads are actually a fairly um, bad fit for traditional research methodologies that are used in the computer architecture community. So for example, traditionally, you would choose one of two options. You would either run on a high-performance system-level emulator like QMU or like Simix, which allows you to run 
uh, entire workloads, including Java workloads, but it doesn't account for these fine-grained details in the microarchitecture that you would need to in, uh, actually evaluate the interactions within them. So the alternative to this would be to use a cycle-accurate simulator like GEM5, which gives you a detailed microarchitectural model, allows you to uh, account for these fine-grained interactions, but they are too slow to actually run these large workloads. So what this means is that you're kind of stuck in this in-between point where you need something that needs to be simulated for a very long time, but also at a high fidelity. So whichever of these options you choose, you'll end up with a lack of realism and uh, end up with results that may or may not be as believable as you would like. But even if you could perfectly simulate these kind of workloads, there's another problem. Say we made an innovation in the space between managed runtime systems and architecture and wanted to get it adopted by industry. This is difficult because you would need to find a company that actually has control over these different layers of the stack, including the runtime system and the hardware. So we think that both these problems, realism and industry adoption, can be solved in a new and better way by actually not building on simulators, but instead building on Action Risk V hardware. So if we use this to do our architecture research, what we could do instead is we could run our full Java or other managed workloads on top of real Risk v hardware, run an FPGA-based simulation, and then make our changes to the runtime system, to the operating system, to the hardware, whichever way we want. So we, can, we have control of the entire stack, we can do these experiments, and when we're done, we can actually contribute our results back to the Risk v community and uh, say contribute it to, to Rocketship or another open source code base. So this means that we also have a way to get our research more easily adopted um, into potentially real products. So we have been using this infrastructure in Berkeley for a while. Um, so one way that we're using it, for example, is to uh, work on a, a, a garbage collector coprocessor that is co-designed with a language runtime system like the JVM to perform the garbage collection hardware close to memory um, faster and at a smaller area footprint than a CPU would. And so this is the kind of work that you can then take, run it on FPGA, and evaluate the full stack. But there are a couple of other areas where having this kind of infrastructure helps you with research as well. For example, one problem you often run into is that you want to perform very detailed measurements of uh, your application. So here's a paper from around 12 years ago, for example, where the authors wanted to analyze the memory allocator, so they had to instrument every single memory allocation in your runtime system. But what they found that was that by collecting this data, they actually um, caused perturbation of the performance results, which were larger than the effects that they were trying to measure. If we have custom hardware that we can modify, we can actually do better here, because what we can do instead is we actually instrument the underlying hardware to record the events that we want without perturbing the application performance. So what this means is that uh, you can now run your application, collect all these performance numbers, and then analyze, for example, in this case, every single allocation pause. So to give you an example of what this lets you do is, we uh, took an example here where we were um, annotating our language runtime system to measure every single allocation within it, and then look at the resulting data. If you did this in a traditional way, and you were just sampling allocation rates at, say, a kilohertz or so, you kind of get a feel for how the application behaves over time. But if you actually want to understand individual allocations, the data that you can see is actually not meaningful enough to really understand what the memory allocator is doing. If instead you have a system where you can actually instrument every single allocation, you get much more fine-grained data, which looks like this. And this actually tells you something about what the allocator is doing, because in this case, what we can see is that most allocations finish in a very short amount of time, and only some allocation takes much longer, which is actually exactly what's happening in a memory allocator, because um, most uh, allocations just take a block of the free list and give it to you, and every once in a while you run out of memory and you need to allocate a new block, zero it, and add it to your free list. So this is actually uh, results that allow us to do much more, get a much deeper understanding of what's happening in the system. There are other experiments we can do too, for example. We can, uh, for example, investigate the interactions between our runtime system and the memory system. So here we ran uh, the Jikes RVM on an FPGA uh, together with a model of the DRAM system and we measured the uh, DRAM miss rates. And what we saw, see is that every once in a while we get these predictable patterns where your DRAM miss rate suddenly goes up significantly. And looking to this more, uh, more closely, what we found was that actually these are garbage collection pauses. What we see here is that garbage collection pauses actually have a much higher DRAM row miss rate because they have very little locality. So this allows us to now get a deeper understanding of the behavior of these kind of workloads and how to tune them better. So this is a whole range of research that you can now do with this infrastructure. And when you're done with the work, you can contribute it back to the community and uh, get it into a system like RocketChip. So we think that this will allow you to do uh, 
fairly like wide range of research that was difficult to do with previous infrastructure and pretty excited about what this might let you do. So for the last uh, couple of minutes of this talk, I wanted to quickly switch gears and talk about the general state of Java and RISC-V as well. Uh, so this is not specific to academic research, but more about where we're going with this. So as I mentioned, we have these two uh, Java ports. Um, the JIX Research VM currently has the baseline JIT, uh, but we still don't have an optimizing JIT compiler. So this would be something where uh, we would solicit contributions, uh, which would be very useful for us. Uh, the other JVM, which is probably the one that, uh, that many in this room might be interested in, is the OpenJDK Hotspot JVM. At the moment, we can run this on RISC-V with a zero backend, which is basically an interpreter which is architecture neutral. But what's currently missing is a high-performance JIT compiler. We um, have started work on this port, and it's, um, we have a partially, uh, partial implementation of this compiler. But what we can really use help with is uh, to basically bring this towards a full, fully working JIT compiler and then building an optimizing JIT on top of that. So if you're interested in OpenJDK and interested in getting involved with this work, please talk to me. We are, we are happy to basically contribute what we've done so far and, uh, and help whoever is interested get started on this work. Um, and with this, I would like to wrap up. But before I finish, I'd also like to um, mention that if you're interested in managed languages, please get involved with the J extension workgroup. Uh, we sent out the call this morning, and the goal of this work group is to uh, make RISC-V a better target for JIT interpreted languages. Uh, the, the group is intended to work on a wide range of areas, including uh, dynamic typing, including potential user level uh, trapping support for garbage collection, uh, integer overflow checking, self-modifying code. So if any of this is interesting to you, please get in touch. Uh, you can either uh, contact David Chisnell, who will be the chair of this group. Uh, I'll be the vice chair, so you can find me after this talk or respond to the mailing list. And with that, I'd like to finish, and uh, thank you all.